God, we thank you for your presence that is in this place. Thank you for every daughter who's made it here tonight, in person and online. Thank you. Thank you, God, for being so concerned about them that you would send a word that will apply to their lives, that they can pick it up, they can walk with it, and they can be victorious. Thank you for being concerned about us. Thank you for every opportunity that you afford us to give your name, honor, glory, and praise. I thank you now that you arrest everything that is not like you. Silence all of the noise, every hindrance, every distraction. We command you to flee, cease and desist now in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, God, that our attention is upon your word. Thank you that you will open it up to us and it will take root and it will grow. It will water seeds that have already been planted. And we will receive an increase, 30, 60, and 100 fold. Take care of everything that concerns us as we give our full attention to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Amen. Jeremiah 17, 5 reads, and I'm in the New King James Version. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when, God, when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. That sure is bad. But verse 7 says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Psalms 118 verse 8 says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Verse nine, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Listen, Elder Taronda alluded to it or pointed to it in her opening prayer tonight. Some things that God wants me to share with you all. We're all a seed, right? We're created in the mind of God and we were formed by the word of God in our mother's room and then birthed into the earth. So we're seeds planted, and when we're planted in the right ground, we're to develop into fruit-bearing believers or disciples of Christ. He's placed something in us that we're to develop through our lifetime into who God has predestined us to be before the foundations of the world. So where we're planted matters. Where we're planted matters. Because what's in the soil and what's in the environment, what, what nurtures us, will determine how we live, grow, and develop, or prosper. So our lives of believers are based on faith. Somebody say faith. Faith, faith. We, we come to him by faith. We're saved by faith through, through grace, and we come to him in faith. We live by faith, we walk by faith, and we're rewarded by our faith. So when we misplace our faith, or our trust, or our confidence, we displease God. And we cause our lives to wither a little or by a lot and sometimes very quickly. So we have to put our trust and confidence back in God. So here we look in the text, it talks about placing our confidence in man or in humans in the flesh. And it's like lifting the roots, the roots of our life out of the water and leaving it exposed to the conditions of the world. If we would just stay planted, planted like, like this, this tree that's planted by the rivers of water whose roots go down into the water and they get all the nutrients out of the soil and out of the water that it needs. That when, the, when the winds blow and when the air is dry and when the sun is hot and when the birds come and when the land starts to erode, because the roots are so deep down in the water, it still lives. It flourishes. But if we uproot our faith, by putting confidence in man, we're like that shrub in the desert that's out there all by itself, whose roots are not deep, but they sit on the surface of the dry soil and they're consumed. There's no hope for the future. It says it won't be able to see when goodness comes. So we have to have our faith planted in Jesus. People are often misplace our confidence and we misidentify the cause of our unfruitfulness in the area that we displace our confidence. And we want to blame it on something else when the problem is we put it where it doesn't belong. 
what happens is that God often gives us gifts. He gives us people as gifts. But we're never to put our confidence in him, in them, but to keep our eyes on him. And if we're not careful, you may find yourself shifting your faith and shifting your attention, your confidence and your trust from the giver to the gift. And that's a dangerous but easy thing to do. We have to be careful. See, we pray for relationships, and then once we get the relationship, we don't have a chance to pray. We don't remember to pray. We forget to pray. We're too busy, busy consuming the blessing that God has given us. Or you ask for a strategy in your business, and then you don't have time to stop your grind because you want to be a good steward over what God has opened up to you till we fail to include him on our plans that he gave us. And then we ask God to show us our purpose, and then we kick him out of our day-to-day -day life. We shift oh so subtly sometimes our focus from the giver to the gift. And there's not a problem with it to us until there's a problem with the gift. Until it doesn't stand up to our expectations then we have a problem with it. Until you realize that, that that man that you prayed for, that you said God gave you, he did not 100% fix your insecurities. He did not 100% fix your, 100 fix your longings and, and, and your, your loneliness and, and those holes that were created in you that only God could fill. You love him and you enjoy him until you realize that he's not God. And so uh, when, when the help that God sends you isn't helpful anymore, then it's like, well, what good is this, right? And we become frustrated and we realize that, that what we've asked God for should not be the focus of our affection, should not be the focus of our attention or our faith. But we've subtly, we've subtly shifted our faith and confidence to that person or to that thing. When we become frustrated with the person, then we turn that frustration back on God. Because sometimes we feel like this is who you sent. Remember like Adam was like, is that woman you gave me? We're so, we go to the giver and ask him for the gift. When he gives us the gift, we love on the gift till it frustrates us. And then when we have a problem with the gift, we get angry at the gift and then mad at the giver. The problem with the gift is you. The problem, that the, the frustration that you're having stems from you. The gift didn't do it, and the giver never does it. But us shifting our faith and confidence onto that person, that place, that thing, that opportunity, is what has caused us the problem. So listen, don't blame the one that you chose to make your idol. Change your focus and your affection and put it back on Jesus. Listen, I was frustrated last week. And uh, I mean frustrated, frustrated. I mean, big girl, little girl frustrated. I, 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 I was so frustrated, I had to pause and lean over my kitchen counter and just, <laughs> and cry. I was so frustrated. And the Holy Ghost arrested me. I'd be like, I can't even have a fit real good. He arrested me and said, listen, the problem you're having, you're frustrated because you shifted your confidence from me to the provision that I gave you, and you still called it faith. Because you misidentified, you mislabeled something, you, had a, you developed a wrong relationship with what I put in your life, and now you're frustrated. And there's no need to be angry with the gift. The gift is just being the gift. You have to repent to me and focus back on me. And I said, Lord, please forgive me, Jesus. Please forgive me. I was, getting, I was so frustrated with the gift that I was getting ready to mishandle the gift. And I couldn't understand what the giver was allowing when it was me all the time. I had shifted just ever so slightly. Because sometimes we can, God gives good gifts now. He, and I ain't talking about the pastor. So who's everyone? God gives good gifts. And so we can be so excited about what he's given us and we relax in the fact that he's given us this good gift and we lean on it instead of depending on God who gave it. Because at any moment, like Job said, the Lord gives and he takes away. So we have to, we have to make sure that our affection, our confidence is on the Lord and not the provision.
Could some of your past or current frustration be because you shifted your faith and your confidence? I want you to go back in your mental Rolodex, if a Rolodex is not too old for some of the younger ladies. <laughs> go back in the recesses of your mind and just think, what, what was the last thing I was frustrated about? Could it have anything to do with the fact that you put more confidence in that than in God? Okay, so if yes is your answer, let's go ahead real quick and let's repent. Lord, forgive us and help us to get it together and put our affection back on you. We have to simply just realign ourselves with what he has for us. Anytime you can recognize a pattern of frustration about people who aren't doing what you wanted them to do, what you thought they would do, what you felt like they were sent to do. You know, if you, if you have somebody that comes to help you, um, say they're coming to clean your home, and then all of a sudden it's not as clean as it used to be, you start getting frustrated, but you never said anything. Right? You need to speak up right? You need to give attention to what it is. If we, we're always noticing a pattern of frustration with people not meeting the expectations that you set, perhaps your expectation is the problem because you're putting more weight on somebody than they're supposed to carry. You have to inspect your roots. You got to look at yourself and see, Lord, where did I go off on this? And help me not to be upset with the person that I didn't know how to properly integrate into my life. Ask God to show you, Lord, what seed are they supposed to have in my life? What seed am I supposed to have in their lives? So that we can have a balanced relationship. Make it easy, because the truth is, it's easier to have confidence in what you can see and feel and what has some, some, sometimes proven to have a track record in your life than to lean on a sovereign, invisible God. But we have to trust him. We have to trust him and know that God can provide people, but people aren't your foundation. They can't be your foundation. Christ is our firm foundation. Jesus Christ is the solid rock on which we stand. All other ground, all other earth, all other folks are sinking sand. And so we have to stand with Jesus. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I ain't God. Count me out. Now look at the other lady and say, count them out. <laughs> That's my title tonight, count me out. Because see, it's, it's necessary for people to understand healthy boundaries for your sake and for theirs. If we don't develop healthy boundaries, we'll be all over the place and mad at each other all the time. And God, why did you do this? And God, why did you do that? Oh, you outside the lines. You're outside the boundaries, and it's not his fault at all. But we can't be anybody's personal Jesus. You're nobody's savior. And you don't have to try to be. You don't have to try to be. And it's so one-sided sometimes. We feel like, you know, you can't, I'm not your savior. I don't want to do that for you. But then you go to somebody else, would you save me? Would you be my personal Jesus? Now, we don't say it like that, but that's how we act. You know, we'll push people away. No, I don't have time for you. So, you know, I can't. Don't make me your God. But over here, you want somebody else. You want to consume all of their time because you need something from them that you really need from God. So we have to be careful. We have to be careful to understand that we don't want to cause anybody to stumble. And we don't want to be wedged between somebody's faith and their sight. We don't want to be wedged between what God has said and what they're supposed to become by always inserting ourselves or being dragged and wedged into something. Wedged into something. Listen, our expectations. I, what I've learned to do in this most recently, recently in the last several years, over 40. Because 40 is so freeing. I'm actually, you know, you got to round up. I'm closer to 50 than 40 now. But, but what I've learned to do is when I sense that somebody is developing an unhealthy attachment with me, I back up. I back up because I know my assignment is to carry you to the feet of Jesus and then model godly behavior. But I can't carry you like a, you're not my cross to bear. So, so we have to be very careful with that. I pick up and my, my Uber, my taxi goes two places. It picks you up at the point of your need and drops you off at the feet of Jesus. I can't do any more than that. And sometimes you have to tell people that. 
Sometimes you have to have a candid conversation and say, listen, I recognize that you've put me in a seat that doesn't belong to me. Or I recognize that I've put myself in a seat in your life that doesn't belong to me. And we need to repent to those people when we realize it's us. Moms have a hard time with that sometimes. We want to sit in God's seat in our children's lives and take care of it all. And what we cannot handle, then we yield to the Lord. That's so jacked up, y'all. What kind of what kind of crooked parenting is that? I mean, it's, we're trying to do the best we know how, but the Bible instructs us that we have to seek God about everything. And so while we can model godly behavior, and we can model the life of a worshiper and the life of one who is submitted to the word of God, we cannot be our children's God. We can't be their Holy Ghost. You know, we, we, my mama sent me to college and, and the Holy Ghost had to go with me. Now he sounded a lot like her. While I was learning the voice of God, why? Because the things that she was sowing into my life were from the word of God. So when I heard it and it sounded like her voice, it, it was his word coming to me. Now I've sent a child off to college and I can't be his Holy Ghost. I would love to wrap him in a bubble and let him out for class and put him back in there. You know, and then you can go have a little fun. Ah, that's enough. And come on back. But he'll never learn to grow his relationship with God if I'm always in the way. Look at your sister and say, get out the way. Get out the way. Listen, and, and I, don't mean to, I don't mean to suggest that you completely abandon someone, especially if they're in a mental health crisis. I'm not saying that, but what I'm not, I'm also not saying that you should be held hostage until the hostage taker is ready to let you go. So sometimes you have to get back your way out of it slowly, and then other times you have to run like your pants are on fire because it's so toxic and unhealthy. It's easier to identify, however, though, when somebody else is, has inserted themselves in your life or when somebody else is frustrating you because the stress that comes with it. It's not as easily discerned when you've inserted yourself in the wrong seat in somebody else's life. That's why we have to be prayerful. We have to fast, we have to pray, we have to ask God for discernment so that we don't take a seat that belongs to him. We don't wanna do that, it's necessary. It is necessary to seek God for everything and in everything because otherwise we can get off course so easily and be off when the rapture comes or be off when he calls your name. I don't, listen, I'm not, I don't want to go to hell for little stuff. I, I don't, I don't want to go to hell for having one foot in the next lane and one in the, in the correct lane. I, I, I like, that's, no, 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 no. I always thought, you know, if you go into hell, bust it wide open. <laughs> At least think you're enjoying the trip. Right now, I don't want nobody to go to hell, so y'all. Live godly. Live God. <laughs> repent every morning, repent every night, you know, live, and, and live holy in between. <laughs> but I don't, I don't want to miss what God wants to do. I don't want to miss him using me. I don't want to miss uh, his goodness. Yeah. I don't want to be like that, that tree in the desert that's roots are, are, are too superficial, and then I'm consumed. And my life never unfolds to be this glorious thing that God has created. So I, 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 I want to admonish you to make sure that you are seeking God and that your faith and confidence remain in him alone, in him alone. Listen, the Bible says in Proverbs 17 and 17, a friend um, loves at all times and the brother is called for the day of adversity, right? So we get hung up being so loyal to our detriment that we're in the way of the progress of our friend. A loyal friend doesn't always have to be physically by your side. A loyal friend isn't one, they don't get the, the title of friend, just be, they shouldn't, just because they tell you yes. But if you have a friend that will tell you, listen, we need to take a break, because you got to get your focus back on God. I'm trying to walk with Jesus and I'm trying to, to, to follow his instructions every step of the way and listen, you ain't doing it. So I need you to get it together. I'm going to be praying for you, and we, we can't walk together except we agree. 
and our lifestyles and our choices and our devotional time and our focus and our attention and our confidence are going in separate directions. They don't agree. They don't agree. It doesn't mean you're going to hell, but we're not walking in agreement right now. So in this season, we're going to have to take a pause. Unless we're going to come together and we're really going to seek after and go after God together, it's okay. I love you, but I ain't got time for the stuff we've been doing. I got to change the way I'm going. I got to change the way I'm walking. I got to change the way I'm talking. Listen, our conversation needs to be that of Christian women. That it glorifies God. Can someone find you anywhere you are, any conversation you have, would you be ashamed to have somebody walk up on you and hear what you're talking about? I don't know if anybody could say, yeah, 100% of the conversations I have, I don't mind people walking up on. Now, some of the conversations I have with my husband is my business. <laughs> so I ain't talking about that. <laughs> However, when you're having a conversation, is it a chase conversation? Is it becoming of a Christian? Or are we dogging somebody out? Are we having a lust-filled conversation? Are we having a, 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 a carnal conversation in the house of God? Are we sitting outside waiting to, do our, to serve for the next service and having a, a tacky carnal conversation? Or are we remaining prayerful? Are we, in, are we coming up on the parking lot playing the right music or are we still jamming to what? I'm gonna put it on your children, hat on Saturday night. What are, we, what are we doing? Where is our affection? Where is our confidence? Where is our trust? Where is our faith? And it has to be in God even when his answer to our request is no. Some of us can bear with weight. We'll accept a weight. But when God tells you no to a thing, will you still trust him or do you try to work it out yourself? Do you try to force a, 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 a thing to happen and then want to put God on it? I always go here with y'all. I guess it's because it's girl talk. But listen, ladies, those of you who are dating or who are not married, let's just put it like that. You can be engaged, looking, waiting, don't care, doesn't matter. Uh, when you are dating, don't date outside of husband material. Don't date outside of what you want your husband to be. Don't date somebody that you have to transform because you can't do it. The Bible tells you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you know how hard that is. Why do you think that you can transform a man's mind? And, mm, and you can't transform his mind when all you've given him is behind from junk. It don't work like that. I love y'all. I mean it. All of sin and come short of his glory, okay? I'm not passing judgment. I'm making observations. I'm stating facts, and I'm telling you the truth. We have to walk holy. We have to walk like our confidence is in God that he will provide somebody for me. I don't have to dole out my flesh and see who's the highest bidder, which one I'm going to stick with. I'm going to keep my legs closed. I'm going to keep my hands lifted. I'm going to keep my attention on Jesus. And he's going to send the one to see me as a worshiper. When he gets done worshiping, he notices me. I'm so tired of y'all being dragged or jumping into the wrong relationships and then asking God, I don't know what's going on. I want my purpose. Your purpose wasn't attached to him, so it can't be fulfilled until you let him go. Men get old, and so do you. But Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. So listen, listen, what, what I'm trying to say is, cast not away your confidence, but trust in God that he is able to perform the good thing that he spoke until the day of Jesus Christ. He is not slack concerning his promises concerning you. And he can turn any situation around. Listen, when you get into something, if you will give it to God, yeah, he can come in and change it. But if you start out uh, from, the, from the better side, knowing ahead of time, let's do that. 
right? Okay, I realize some ladies are in here already married. I'm not telling you to divorce your husband. I wouldn't dare do that, do that unless he's knocking you in your head and abusing you and your children. And the Bible gives you other outs. But if he, listen, but that choice is yours. That choice is yours. That choice is yours. If you are not in harm's way, I wouldn't ever tell you to leave your husband. Because it says the believing wife sanctifies the husband. But if he never gets saved, he don't get into heaven just because you were. So please, please, that's not what that means. Okay? All right. But, I, but you, you can pray and ask God to move. But then you have to be very careful that you are following God's instructions to the T to be a light to that man, to pull him from where he met you over to where he needs to be. All right? Now, that's for the ladies who are already in that situation by, by legal marriage. Not those of y'all who is illegal common law. It's a mess. It is. I love you. I ain't judging you. I'm just telling you what you got. Right? It's just, it's just what you got. That's what I would tell my children. This is a mess. So how do we clean it up? How do we glorify God? How do we bring God glory in this? How do we come out of this to make it look like what God wants it to be? That is possible. All you got to do is stop sinning. And submit to God. Look at your sister say, stop sinning and submit to God. All right, everybody know what sin I'm referencing? Okay. And all the rest of them. All the rest, stop lying, cheating, and stealing too. <laughs> Got all the way off on that. We have to put our confidence in God. Confidence, our trust. To know that we are sure that he is able. I know who he is. And I may not know exactly what he's doing. But I know he is sovereign. And I've relinquished my control over to him. I've submitted that to him. You, you know, you've heard Bis Bishop start um, preaching with um, a greater insight about God being, in control, being sovereign versus in control. But when you, 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 for what you have control over, if you yield it to him, it gives him back the control. Right? So we have to make sure that our confidence, our faith, and trust is in him alone. It's in him alone. And acknowledge, listen, if we acknowledge him in all our ways, he will direct our paths. But that will require us not leaning on our own understanding. We have to submit it to him. Listen, in my worship time today, and I'm getting ready to close because I want to pray with you ladies. My worship time today, God was speaking some things to me, and I know it was to me personally, but also to some of you. And this is, this is what he said. Some people have had the answer all the time. You've had the answer all along because you came to know Jesus at an early age. You were introduced to him early. You never had to search, but you looked anyway. You looked anyway. What caused you to take your eyes off of me? The answer. What caused you to cast your confidence and put it in flesh, put it in man, put it in an opportunity, put it in a thing? What caused you to take your eyes off of me? The answer. You started focusing on the help or the resource that I sent you instead of me and you became lazy. Some of the frustration I allowed to get you to notice that you need me, that you need to redirect your attention to me. Now that you know, stop being mad at them and focus on me. I've said much of this already. My people want to see so much from me, but they won't see what they haven't heard first. Stop looking and start listening. The Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. You've got to listen to his word. You've got to read his word. You've got to soak in his word. You've got to make sure that your roots are, are anchored in his word. Because everything else, heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will remain. It will not fade. Not one jot, not one tittle. His word will remain the same. So we've got to be soaked in worship and soaked in prayer, making sure our roots are strong. My people want to see so much, but they won't see what they haven't first heard. Stop looking and start listening. 
His heart is grieved. He won't, why won't my people listen so they can keep their eyes on me? I've always been the answer. He wants us to repent and listen. And what you hear, he'll allow your eyes to see. What you see in his word, you'll begin to see in your life. What you see in his word, what you hear in his word, what you, what you soak up in his word, you'll begin to see in your home. You'll begin to see it on your job. We'll begin, we'll begin to see it manifest even greater in this ministry and in everything that God has set your hand to do. But we've got to listen. We've got to soak up his word. We've got to fast and we've got to pray. We've got to cast not away our confidence, not put our trust in man, not put our trust in powerful people. The Bible says in Psalms 146 and 3, don't trust in a powerful person for when they die, their plans die with them. You, you, you're, 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 they're only helpful as long as they're breathing. So we cannot cast our trust and faith and confidence into things that are temporary. But we have to put, make our, sure our hope is built on what is eternal. And that is the word of God. So we've got to soak up his word and don't let our leaves wither. Listen, the scripture said in Jeremiah 17 and, and 8, listen, your, your leaf will not wither. It'll always be green. You'll always be walking in, in prosperity. You'll always be walking in enough. You'll always have the word of God present with you if your roots are drenched in his word. I, I just, I, you know, sometimes I don't think we're really convinced of that. Yes, trials will come. Yes, things will happen. Yes, people will be born. Yes, people will die. There will be, there, there'll, there'll be times that Life sends you things that you, you have to steady your feet on the word of God and, and take a grip and, so that you can make it through. But you don't ever have to be destitute. You don't ever have to be void of wisdom and understanding. It says he gives to the one who asks liberally. Liberally. Everything we need is in his word. Everything we need is in his word. Every question that you could ever have, he'll answer it. Seek his word and then pray in the spirit. And he'll download it to you. He really will show you. He really does want you to, to trust him. He really does want to take your hand and walk you through life. He really does want to order your steps. You, we really don't have to fall. Jude says he's able to keep us from falling. He's able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. We don't have to fall. For real, y'all, we don't have to fall. If you seek him first, ask him for direction. It's not hard to ask. You just got to be patient and listening. And that's the problem. We don't want to sit long enough to hear his response. We don't want to continue to read far enough in the scripture to find the answer. Because I'm frustrated now. Because I got this grief now. Because I have this problem now. Because I'm broke now. I'm hungry now. I'm tired now. I got this bill right now. But you didn't create it now. You took your time and got in debt. <laughs> we understand it takes time to change our credit and we work on it. Well, it takes time to train your ear to hear the voice of God, to hear the answer, to know his response. And, and, the, and the more you rehearse it and the more you pray and the more you read and the more you study, the quicker the answers come because you have more to pull from. You have more resources, resources. Somebody who spent time in the library knows how to help you find what it is you were looking for until they took the books out the library. My son just told me the other day, my we ain't got no books in our library. What is that building for? Maybe we should have a Brook Coastal or something because why y'all, <laughs> I know it's no books in the library. Everything's digital, but you still need a librarian to help you get through the digital files. And because she is trained in that, she can help you find what you're looking for more easily. The, the more you access the word of God, the more quickly you have access to answers. Yes. 
I use Mother Richardson for example. She has, she has steeped her life in the word of God. So it's not a question about the word of God that you can ask her that she can't give you an answer quickly. And she may tell you, let me go back and make sure by the time you go to have another conversation, <laughs> she doesn't snuck up behind you. It, the word says in first John, you know, but that's a life steeped in his word. But she knew a whole lot of scripture before she became the age she is now. If you do it early, you'll have the answers early. So you don't have to be in your 50s, your 60s, your 70s, your 80s to know God. We always act, we, 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 make, we make the mothers of the church icons. They were daughters of Zion before they were mothers. They didn't just develop the relationship when they became old enough to be your mama. They started walking with God at your age or younger. Start now. What I'm trying to tell you is start now. If you feel like you're behind, you can catch up. You got to double time it. Get in your word in the morning. Get in your word at lunch. Get in your word before you go to bed. Pastor Nikki, I don't understand all of it. Read it anyway. He'll give you understanding. Before you crack that book open, Lord, give me understanding of what this is saying. Okay, if King James is too much, go on down to NIV, NLT, somebody. Not so much the message remix. <laughs> That's a little, takes a little something out of it. Get you a version that you can understand more readily and get the principles. And then begin to lock down the actual words from the scripture. Then you lock down the address of the scripture. Where is it found? Right? Knowing where it's found is, is almost a little more important than what it says. Because if you can get around about it and paraphrase, and I th the idea of the principle was in Luke 7 and 7, you can go to Luke 7 and 7 to get clarity. So you need to practice finding the address, the scripture location, the book, the chapter, the verse, where it is. You know, some of you, some of your memories are, well, it's on page 1359 in my Bible. Fine, go to page 1359, but you better keep that Bible. Because <laughs> it's going to change. But what, regardless of where you are and what you're facing, tonight, put your confidence in God. Put your faith in him. Come on, let's stand on our feet. Put your faith in him. And so I'm going to ask our ministers to come up. If there's anybody that says, listen, Pastor Nikki, tonight, I just need, I just need a, a, a little prayer. I need a little encouragement that I'm going to get back on track. That I'm going to put my confidence in him. Lord, if you just give me you, everything else can wait. I need you. That, that thing I was asking for, that prayer I've been praying, that answer I've been waiting for, Lord, it can wait. If it's not what you have for me, it can wait. I need what you have for me. I need what you want for me. God, forgive me for putting my confidence in the wrong thing. For thinking that gift was greater than the giver. For thinking that I had a way to figure it out when I knew you had already worked it out. Lord, give me you. Show me that you're the one who has earned my confidence and my faith. Lord, I thank you for these, your women, your daughters. Y'all come pray for them. You, these women, your daughters. Lord, I thank you that you are answering their prayer. That they will no longer cast away their confidence, but that they're placed in you. That they will give it to you, Lord. That they are coming to you. That you would take your rightful place. That their, the posture of their heart would be one of submission that they're going to follow you, Lord, that you're going to give you glory, Regina, that they're going to trust you. Lord, I thank you that for every question that she has, that you send the answer. God, I thank you that you take care of everything that concerns her. I thank you, Lord, that she will trust you again. She's going to trust you with the hard thing. She's going to trust you with the difficult thing. God, I thank you that we can trust you with all of the affairs of our heart, all of the longing all of the lonely places. God, that we can lean into you and you will answer us. You will hear us. God, I thank you that you know exactly what your daughters need tonight. 
that they need to be confident in you. Yes, Lord, that they will sit with you, that they will sit with your word, that you will take care of them. God, I thank you that they can trust you to know that you haven't thrown them away. Maybe we stepped away, but you never left us. You haven't forsaken us. God, I thank you, and I give you glory. Minister Amber, would you come pray with them? God, I thank you that her heart is set towards you tonight, that she finds strength in you, that she finds help in you, that she finds healing in you, that she'll know that she is the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that there is nothing too hard for you, God, that you are the giver of every good and perfect gift, that they come from you, but that we give them back to you and give you glory. God, I thank you for what her heart longs for, God. You are the answer. You are the answer. God, I thank you that as they seek you, they will find you, that you will be with them everything that they need. God, that you are their salvation, that you are their peace, that you are their song, that you are taking care of them, that you know right where they are. God, and you love them so. Your will is not for them to remain there, but to come closer to you, that you would heal and make her whole, that you wash her and make her new. God, that her confidence in you would be restored, that her posture, her position in you would be restored, that the call that is on her life would be, that would be reframed, oh God, and she would see it through eyes of faith. God, I thank you that she will walk according to your word, that she will bring your name glory, honor, and fame. I thank you, Jesus, that you are healing now. Thank you that you are solidifying and stabilizing now. Thank you that you are forgiving and you are renewing. Thank you for newness of life, God. Thank you for strength. Thank you, oh God, for peace that passes all understanding. Thank you for another opportunity to find our help in you. Thank you for another opportunity to find rest and peace in you. Thank you, oh God, for your word that does not fail and does not change, that it is constant through the ages, from the beginning of time, throughout all eternity. Your word is right and it is good. It is perfect to convert our souls. God, it is sweet like honey, sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. Thank you that it is healing to our bodies, to our souls. daughter. She is beloved. She is chosen. She is royalty. God, I thank you that the call on her life is still good. You're still calling. You're still forming. You're still securing. You're still establishing. God, thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for another chance. Thank you for purifying our hearts, our intentions, and our motives. God, thank you that your daughter is going to begin to shine like her father, that her, your characteristics, your character, oh God, would be seen in her. God, restore to her the joy of her salvation. For what the enemy has stolen, he cannot possess. God, thank you that you are giving her back everything that belongs to her. Her joy, her peace, her song, her deliverance, her strength, her way, her vision, her fortitude. Make her tenacious, oh God, her thirst as she reads your word, as she worships you. God, speak to her. Speak clearly. Make your will clear. Make your word to shine, oh God, in her life. And we thank you that perfect love casts out fear. That your word and, and your light is that shining in darkness to light her way. For you promised that your word would be a light and a lamp. God, we thank you for the ability to see by what we hear and we trust you we love you and we praise you it is so in Jesus name in Jesus name amen. come on and give God some praise Hallelujah. thank you Jesus come on and give him some praise if you know that he's given you a course correction tonight that you can go home and evaluate your life and, and, and make sure that God, my faith and my confidence have not been misplaced.
but they're in you. It's on you. Listen, look at your sister and say, count me out, but count God in. Listen, I might not be able to be a part of your treatment plan, but I won't stop praying for you. I might not be able to walk through it with you physically, step by step, but I'm praying for you. The relationship may be a little different, but I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you because I can't be your Jesus and you can't be mine. If we want him to be glorified, we've got to seek him and him alone. So God, I thank you for every one of your daughters that has joined here tonight in person and online. God, thank you for being a good father, faithful and loving king. Thank you that you send your word to heal us, to correct us, to exhort and rebuke, for instruction in righteousness. Thank you, God. Thank you that we're going to look more like you as we continue to walk through your word. We're going to look like your daughters. We're going to possess your authority. And we're going to use it in this earth to bring your name glory. We thank you now that you cover, you protect, you keep, and you guide till we come back again in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Listen, ladies, if you have a gift to give, I want you to put it in our offering, in our offering boxes. If you need an offering envelope, our ushers will be glad to serve you if you lift your hand. God, I thank you that you give seed to the sower, that you bless it 30, 60, 100 fold, for this is good ground, and we are good stewards. We shall see all that you've promised us. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you. Hug a sister. We're on our way home.